Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Moving through the month of fasting and the end is in sight. And we consider where we have been, the journey that we have taken, the landscape which we have crossed, the highs, the lows, the difficult times, the dry times, the times of feasting. It's always a time of tarir, telwin, uh, transformation. Uh, and we consider also, uh, and this is what I'd like to focus on today, uh, the message of Ramadan. What's the message of Ramadan? <laughs> uh, with all of the other obligations of the religion, you can actually point to it and say, there it is. You can say, there is the prayer of Islam. What a magnificent thing. Hasn't changed since the beginnings of the religion and everybody's amazed because who else follows the form of worship set by the founder of their religion? Only the Muslims. Zakat, you can point to it, people actually putting money in the tin, and inshallah will remember our Zakat al-Fitr this year. The Hajj, again, spectacular. There is a certain visual amazingness about these pillars. Ramadan, well, it has a certain festive social aspect in many Muslim places, but you can't actually take a photograph of somebody fasting. <laughs> not really very indicative because fasting is not doing things. Inwardly, it can be all kinds of spiritual advances, but those two are not exactly photogenic. So let's consider if we can use all of these forms of ibadah for da'wah, uh, and da'wah is the only justification really for us living as minorities in the Western world, but it's a high calling, a prophetic calling. How can we think about the tabligh, the da'wah, the conveyance on the basis of fasting? Uh, so much of Islam is visually stunning and so much of it is evidently transformative. Uh, but Ramadan, how do you show Ramadan to somebody? Well, what we usually do is say uh, to the local vicar, the interfaith group, why don't you fast a day with us this year to get a feel for it? But they don't really get a feel for it. They just go hungry for a bit and thirsty, but it's not, not the same thing. It's just a kind of diet, and they may experience it as that. Uh, and there are people whose journey to Islam was slow, and I remember in particular Almarhum Dennis Johnson Davis, who was a student here in Cambridge uh, a long time ago, in the time of Professor Nicholson, so that must have been the 1930s. He died only about five years ago. He had his supervisions with Nicholson on Arabic and Persian poetry, just a couple of hundred yards from us here in CMC. Uh, and he became the greatest translator of Arabic fiction modern Arabic novels. You might think, well, that's a strange thing to spend your life on. Why not the great classical literature of Islam? But this was what he was good at, and he was very good at it, and it was on the basis of his translation of Najib Mahfouz's Midak Ali that Najib Mahfouz got the Nobel Prize. So up there in the world of translators. And he lived in the Arab world and in Cairo and Marrakesh, but for years and years he wasn't a Muslim but he used to fast in Ramadan. <laughs> and we would tell him, uh, Dennis, you're wasting your time, really. You're not going to get the ajr, and you're not going to experience the, the inner meaning of this. But he just liked Arab culture and wanted to go along with it. Eventually, he came to Islam, but I'm not sure that it was the experience of fasting or his sort of conformity to the fast that did that. But nonetheless, in the month, how can we express the amazingness of this ibadah to our neighbours who, as it were, are fasting from religion? And they know that they're missing something. And everybody is looking for something because there's been religion, ritual, belief in transcendence, belief in life after death, 
in a huge variety of forms since the beginning of the human species and it's part of what we need metabolically it's part of us so if we have a mosque in Ramadan and we need to be da'wah conscious well obviously driving people away is not a good idea he says alayhi salatu wasalam bashiru wa la tunafiru give people good news and don't drive them away uh, now if everybody is after the tarawih coming noisily laughing out into the streets slamming the doors of their fancy cars and not attending to the needs of neighbors who are trying to sleep that's tanfir that's driving people away and this can be a problem and often is a problem for neighbors who are not Muslims but are living near a mosque. Ramadan is often a difficult time. We really need to be aware of that and mosque committees need to make sure that they tell people to, you know, al-jari dhil qurba wa al-jari al-junub. The near and the far neighbor, according to many of the ulama, means the Muslim neighbor and the non-Muslim neighbor. They also have a haq. And this is in many hadiths. But that's for another, another talk. But uh, how can we go beyond that and turn this into a time of tabligh and da'wah? Hmm. And we know this is so central. <coughs> Allah says, الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ Those who convey the messages of God. These are amongst the righteous. Hmm. Ya ayyuha nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira wa da'iyan ila Allah bi idnihi wa sirajan munira O prophet is speaking to the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam we have sent you as a witness and as the bearer of good news and of a warning and as a summoner to Allah with his permission and as a shining light Now that's a complex verse and much can be unpicked. What is the relationship of the prophet as witness to the prophet as bearer of good news and a warning? Some people will say religions about akhirah. All of the tabligh is good news and a warning. So what's this shahid? How is he witness to mankind and how are the believers to be shuhada'a ala nas? This idea of the faithful Muslim as shahid, as witness, is really important. In everything that we do, we are living out in an embodied form, and our ibadahs are often very body uh, embedded, are saying, Bala shahidna, yes, we bear witness. We began as witnesses, shuhada, to the divine in that time before time began, the day of Alas to be we said, yes, we bear witness, we testify. So the shahid, which is one of these prophetic names, is the one who in everything in his or her life testifies to the reality that God alone has true being and everything else is perspectival and temporary, which is a radical perspective. The de-absolutizing of matter, time and space, these are muhtath, contingent, they're not the source of anything. They are uh, caused, they're not a cause. So we bear witness to that in our various forms of ibadah. And of course in the Hajj, uh, Ibadatul Umar, the form of worship which is for the whole life, uh, we remember the day of Bala Shahidna when we kiss or make our istilam to the black stone, which is Allah's right hand on earth. And that's one of the meanings of the Hajj that we get together again as believing Bani Adam to say Bala Shahidna, yes we bear witness, which is part of the meaning of the talbiyah. And in the prayer, we have the witnessing prayer, which is called the tashahud, at the end of the prayer. And that's an important component of the prayer, which is also witnessing. In the first pillar itself, it's called the witnessing, the testimony of faith, the shahada. It is the witness. The zakat is a testimony to our belief. Nobody really knows if you've paid it or not, or what your intention was. It's an inner witnessing to your sense of responsibility to others and your awareness that your money is only ever temporarily in your charge, and so on. So in what sense is the fast then part of this 
tabligh da'wa in this broad sense of witnessing. What does it witness to? Many things. Non-Muslims are often taken aback by the fast because it seems pretty hardcore. It is, you know, people go through various detox diets nowadays and fasting is a kind of standard thing even amongst quite secular people in the uh, world of self-care and natural remedies. And we know that what they call intermittent fasting is good for us no food, no drink for a particular period of time. It does have verifiable medical consequences. So you can use that as a way of witnessing. That's part of being a shahid in Ramadan saying, well, we really do this for a month, a lunar month, uh, cold turkey from dawn till dusk, nil by mouth, very healthy. And we feel kind of great at the end of it. And we really feel different. We really feel like something in the mind body composite has shifted and become much more healthy as a result of this month of Ramadan. It has a therapeutic value. So that's one way in which we can be shuhada'a ala nas, witnesses to mankind in this month of Ramadan. But sometimes the mere fact of this extraordinary thing kind of attracts people's attention uh, because they wonder why is it that you are going through this austerity? So footballers, Premier League footballers like Paul Pogba or um, Mo Salah and so forth. There's plenty of observant Muslims in the Premier League teams often fast in Ramadan even in the summer when they're playing matches. Not always there's Rukhsa which it seems to me to be valid but sometimes they fast and there's always a flurry of media attention. It was the same during the London Olympics. Over a thousand of the athletes were actually fasting in Ramadan and continued to fast during the Olympics. That gets people curious. People want to know, what is this? And there you can give them the most fundamental message of religion, not just monotheistic religion, but all religion, which is that we become ourselves when we transcend ourselves. It's not just about self-knowledge, it's about the self-knowledge that flows from a wisdom about ourselves that is only possible when we have fought with ourselves. It's only when we say no to the cravings of the lower self that we become ourselves really. In the technical language, when we move from nafs amara to nafs lawama, the self that is always commanding us to indulge, head for the fridge, look at this improper image, say this to such and such a person, whatever the nafs dictates, amara, it's like an amir is a prince, this ego is in charge, wants to tell us what to do and make us its slaves. Moving to the stage of nafs lawama, fala uqsimu bin nafs lawama, it's a Quranic expression, just as amara is an emphatic form, constantly commanding, the lawama is also a constant form, constantly blaming. In other words, the conscience is there. We know that we're indulging ourselves and that we do a thousand things that we shouldn't really do in every 24-hour period, <coughs> but at least we're aware of that. And this is a precious message. All the world religions say, happiness comes about through renouncing immediate and sensual forms of amoral personal gratification in the short term. <coughs> it's about future planning. But it's about substituting the kind of sickened surfeit that comes about through indulgence or drunkenness, overeating, whatever it might be, replacing that false happiness with the true happiness that comes about when we know that the ruh is amara. The higher potential within us is commanding uh, and is being obeyed. The ruh, which is min amri rabbi, which is of the command of my Lord. Mm. That's a different kind of happiness, and that's a true happiness. The happiness that comes about through renouncing something that should be renounced <coughs> is a truer and deeper happiness than the happiness that comes about through saying, oh well, be a devil, just this once, I'm feeling low, let me do X, Y, Z, I know it's not right, but I need to cheer myself up, which is never a true happiness, and which immediately vanishes into nothing, as with dunya indulgence. 
I've had a hard year, I'll treat myself to a new car. Within a week you're kind of used to it and worried about the insurance and scratching it and it becomes just another part of your world of worry. <coughs> and the initial excitement probably didn't last beyond the day when you had to take the plastic off the seats and it just became a car and you started worrying about it. So dunya always offers us ghurur, beguiling but false happiness. And the true happiness comes about when we oppose the lower self, when, as Imam al says, we stab with the knife of renunciation the lower self <coughs> and wade up to our knees in the blood of the lower self, in that mujahada and that riyadah, uh, and in that victory, or even in a rare victory, there is a certain happiness and serenity that ensues. And we can look back on that moment as an honourable moment when our humanity was real, rather than our animality. Ramadan gives us that. It's really spiritual. All of the five pillars are really spiritual. This is spiritual in a kind of suluk way, <coughs> in that it takes us from the instant gratification of the random immediate urges to something more considered and to the state at least of nafs lawama. Now the higher stage, and nafs al-mutma'inna, the soul at peace, <coughs> which is mentioned elsewhere in the Qur'an, that's rare, that's hard to achieve. Where you are completely at ease with whatever Allah is doing with yourself at a particular time and you're in a state of shukr and hamd constantly, uh, because you can see that whatever is happening is what God is making happen, uh, and then you're really at peace. That's a person who doesn't suffer from stress or anxiety or panic attacks because everything is what the beloved has determined it to be. That's a high degree. But at least taking the step towards it, towards that real happiness and away from pseudo-happiness, the sickliness of over-indulgence, is the vital thing that puts us on the path of humanity to recovering the amana, to recovering the remembrance of bala shahidna and testifying to the divine in what we do and in our lifestyle, that we're people who don't just go through the motions of religion but inwardly aren't changed very much and perhaps are rotten people underneath, but are actually changed inwardly by these practices. So as Ramadan draws to an end, we really have to look into our souls and interrogate ourselves and say, are you better now? Allah has given you this opportunity to transcend these lower cravings. Are you a more serene, and a better person, or are you just hungry, thirsty, cross, impatient? Hadith says, many a person who fasts gains nothing from his fast except hunger and thirst. That's a, a big sacrifice for just being hungry and thirsty. No, we need to see the extent to which we have moved from the state of nafs amara to the state of nafs lawama, and we get a sense that the destination of this path is actually happiness that the austerity of the fast leads to the delight of the iftar and also to the delight of hamd and shukr and being content with Allah's decree. <coughs> so inshallah this has been an educational Ramadan for us, a Ramadan that has brought us together in birr and taqwa, in goodness and in fearing Allah and in its purpose which is la'allakum tattaqoon, that you might be piously aware of him and has helped us in our suluk, in our wayfaring back to our divine source, so that we can start to travel back to him, even before the inevitable ma'ad, which is after death, we can start to travel back to him and become shuhada, witnesses to God, to people who really want some spiritual form, and really want some kind of belief, but are living in a spiritual desert, and are fasting from everything that human beings truly need, from the spiritual nourishment, without which our souls are always in a state of grief and deprivation. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be joyful in him, help us to experience the sweetness of overcoming the lower self, after the month is over to keep us as people who defy the nafs ammara, the lowest self, and people who are either in that state of contrition or inshallah moving towards the beautiful liberated state of being completely in charge 
of our impulses by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is al-fawz al-azim, that is the great uh, triumph. And when we're at that degree, of course, we'll be shuhada'a ala nas because we'll be such amazing people. Who doesn't love somebody who doesn't care about his own passions and preferences and reputation and desire? Who doesn't love a selfless person? Mm? That's how we are called to be. This ummah should be shuhada'a ala nas because of its self-transcendence. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us these things and accept our fast and bring us safely to the Eid and to the next Ramadan and by his leave to the Ramadans which are to follow and unite us all in whatever is most pleasing to him and make this a time for the liberation of the spirit and the chaining of the devil and of the lower self, insha'Allah. Innahu ala dhalika la qadir wa bil ijadati wa bil ijabati jadir barakallahu fikum. والعفو منكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته